uh, the book. Happy people are annoying. Got it right here. My and, man. Um, so first of all, what's the title all about here? Happy people are annoying. Why'd you go with that title? And what were some of the challenges for you going through your life? Uh, were, was there any points uh, that were challenging for you to look back on and kind of, you know, recapture and make sure you get them accurately put down on the paper? Yeah, I think initially I just always assumed that happiness was reserved for quarterbacks and pretty people and uh, those with inherited wealth. And I walked around the world thinking like, oh, everyone seems to have this manual on living that I just was not privy to because everything hurt a little bit more. Everything felt a little more uncomfortable. And I just was hyper analytical always in my head. And my journey through life through the last 20 years of challenge, be it, you know, dealing with my dad's stuff, losing 100 pounds, facing drugs and alcohol, and then eventually having to like pivot my career to become sort of adept at, at this new thing that I never thought that would be possible. All those things are what allowed me to redefine happiness for me. And, you know, primarily that has to do with my wife and kid. Um, but again, I never would have been in a position to have attracted my wife and to have the kind of kid I do unless I'd done all the work for, you know, give or take two decades before that. I, I say in the book, a lot of people deserve to be loved, but not everyone can attract the kind of love they're looking for. And it took me a long time to, to be able to attract the kind of person I needed. What's doing, everybody? I'm Alec Lace. Thank you for watching First Class Fatherhood. Today's guest on the podcast is Josh Peck. Josh Peck is an actor, comedian, YouTuber. He rose to fame when he starred on the smash hit Nickelodeon series, Drake and Josh. You can currently see him over on Hulu in the smash hit, How I Met Your Father. He's got a brand new book out right now titled Happy People Are Annoying. The link to the book is down there in the description. While you're down there, smack the subscribe button, tap the like, and let's jump into it right now with Josh Peck on First Class Fatherhood. And joining me now, First Class Father, Josh Peck. Welcome to First Class Fatherhood. Oh, uh, it's my honor. Thank you. All right. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here. Let's start like this. How many kids do you have? How old? I got one kid. He's three years old. His name is Max. He's outstanding. It, Max is not short for anything. Some people think Maxwell or Maximus, but just Max. <laughs> I like that. You one and done here? Or are you going to try for more? No, I, I mean, the best part of kids is making them. So I think we're going to definitely try to do at least a couple more, at least one. I mean, I'm an only child, so I know what it was like for me growing up, which was just lonely. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't want my Max to face the same sort of uh, uh, environment. All right, I like your style there. If you could, uh, Josh, just take one minute here to hit my listeners with a little bit about your background and what you do. Uh, well, I'm an actor um, uh, for the last 20 years. I started out on Nickelodeon. Now I got a new show on. Disney Plus called Turner and Hooch, and I'm on a show right now called How I Met Your Father on Hulu. Uh, I have a podcast called Male Models, and I have a new book out on March 15th called Happy People Are Annoying. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get into the book in just a minute here, Josh, if you could. So so the beginning of your fatherhood journey, you said three years old. So how old were you then when you became a dad, and how did that experience change your perspective on life? I think I was 32, maybe. Yeah, 32 when my son was born, and it, uh, you know, it's like getting hand, handed the keys to a city that's already been built. Uh, and by that, I mean, like, e every relationship you have in life, there's um, there's sort of this, this sort of time spent getting to know someone, and then you grow, an affection grows, and a trust, and then what it results in that is usually love and, uh, and admiration. But with your child, or at least in my experience, that love and admiration comes comes instantly. I didn't have to get to know him. He didn't have to win me over. He didn't have to show up for me. He'll never have to show up for me because, like, this kid could be bad. I don't know. He could be a murderer, and I think I'd still love him. Hopefully not. I'm pretty sure he's more into Sesame Street than he is crime. But um, he's, you know, it just was this instant connection and I understood it right away. Every trope, every corny phrase, every slogan you hear about parenting all became true in an instant. Yeah, very well said, Josh. And one thing, listen, I focus on a lot on this show is the fatherless crisis where we have so many kids growing up without a dad or a father figure in their life. Now, I know you grew up with a single mom. Well, how, how, did, how did that experience for you growing up without a, a father and who became your father figure and how has it kind of affected you so far being a dad yourself? 
I think it was challenging. Look, uh, there's a line I, I talk about in the book where uh, Brad Pitt in Fight Club says, if our fathers were our model for God and our fathers leave, what does that say about God? You know, it's uh, it's just very impactful when 50 percent of your your parenting system isn't there. And I found for me, I took I had this chip on my shoulder where I never could get too close to anyone, especially in, in romantic relationships, because I just felt like they could leave at any moment. It could all sort of evaporate at a moment's notice. So I wanted to be ready. I never wanted someone to see me on my heels or to think that, you know, I was overly um, invested in a relationship. And sometimes even I was proactive in ruining things because I just wanted to make it clear how little I needed you. And of course, with plenty of therapy and uh, bad relationships, I, I, I was forced to face my, my, um, my bad habits, my, my not great actions and moments and see where I needed to do work. So I've been also blessed, though, that in, in addition to having outlets in which to look at myself, to work on myself and, and having help in that way, I also have had great surrogate father figures. Uh, my mom, when I was eight years old, got me a big brother uh, from the Big Brothers Foundation. His name is Dan. He was the best man at my wedding. He's been in my life almost 30 years. And He's uh, someone I look up to to this day, and I'm constantly asking for advice. And now he has kids, and I get to be sort of a surrogate uncle to them. So I'm so lucky to have him in my life. And my father-in-law, um, who, you know, my wife and I have been together 10 years, so I've had him for 10 years. And he's this natural alpha who leads with a very um, sort of deft touch, and he's He's yeah, he, he, he's quiet and stoic, but strong. And I, I've learned so much from him. Well, very well said, Josh. And yeah, uh, the book, Happy People Are Annoying. Got it right here. My man. And, um, so first of all, what's the title all about here? Happy People Are Annoying. Why'd you go with that title? And what were some of the challenges for you going through your life? Uh, were, was there any points uh, that were challenging for you to look back on and kind of, you know, recapture and make sure you get them accurately put down on the paper? Yeah, I think initially I just always assumed that happiness was reserved for quarterbacks and pretty people and uh, those with inherited wealth. And I walked around the world thinking like, oh, everyone seems to have this manual on living that I just was not privy to because everything hurt a little bit more. Everything felt a little more uncomfortable. And I just was hyper analytical always in my head. And my journey through life through the last 20 years of challenge, be it, you know, dealing with my dad's stuff, losing 100 pounds, facing drugs and alcohol, and then eventually having to like pivot my career to become sort of adept at, at this new thing that I never thought that would be possible. All those things are what allowed me to redefine happiness for me. And, you know, primarily that has to do with my wife and kid. Um, but again, I never would have been in a position to have attracted my wife and to have the kind of kid I do unless I did all the work for, you know, give or take two decades before that. I, I say in the book, a lot of people deserve to be loved, but not everyone can attract the kind of love they're looking for. And it took me a long time to, to be able to attract the kind of person I needed. Yeah, great stuff, Josh. Yeah, I think working on yourself uh, is always the key to, I'm a recovering alcoholic and addict myself. So, I mean, I went through a wow. process of myself and I had, I had just about every single thing you could imagine on my blame list, except myself. And once I started putting me on the list, things started to change around for me. So, uh, I, I know a little bit about that there. I want, I wanted to hit on this here. I seen that it says, um, uh, how I met your mother, uh, how I met your father is turning Josh Peck into a hunk. I'm seeing these uh, articles pop up. What's this all about? What's your take on this? You're a long way from Nickelodeon here. You're calling you a hunk. What's this all about? It's about time. That's what it's all about. <laughs> Jeez, I've been working hard, you know, 20 years in this business. Finally, I, I'm being appreciated for my looks. Enough with my talent. I really, you know, I, I just want to be looked at as, as a total, you know, um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I think it's really nice. Look. You know, I, I, I write about something like uh, Turner and Hooch in the book that I made for the last year. So proud of it. It was a real turning point in my career. We do one season, doesn't get picked up again. And then you do a couple episodes of How I Met Your Father, and all of a sudden, you know, people really love it. You don't, you don't know what's going to trigger the zeitgeist, you know, or, or what you're going to get uh, some acclaim for. You just kind of have to put one step in front of the other and, and take the next uh, indicated action. 
Yeah, it's almost like these TikTok uh, stars. Like you, they put up a million ones, and some one of them hits. They have no idea why, and all of a sudden it goes viral. It's amazing. They fire a million shots, and it takes one, and then they're a TikTok star. It's so true. Yeah, you don't know what's going to be the one that 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 finds its way through and really sort of sort of catches fire. You just kind of have to keep shooting. Yeah, and and getting back to you as a dad here, what would you say are the top values that you want to instill in your son Max growing up? You know, at night, like, we'll say a little prayer when he goes to bed, and, and I try to always end it with, like, and, you know, please, God, help us to to help others, because that's what life's all about, because we're so lucky. And, you know, I look at this kid who, you know, it, it took four generations of, of, at least in the Peck family, to correct, like, trauma. Like, my, my mother had a, a challenging childhood, and her father passed away when she was 16, and then she really overcame so much trauma and challenge and was able to sort of give me a really great shot at life. Um, but still, I had to deal with my dad's stuff and being overweight. And I look at my son now, and he's got two parents, and we're, we're not completely dysfunctional kooks. And he's got a loving family and support and a little bit of financial security. And I think like, well, what is this kid's challenge going to be? What's going to make him cool? But you know, what will make him cool is hopefully if I'm able to, you know, instill this idea of that he, you know, just because he might have hit a little bit of a genetic lottery by being born into a really, you know, secure household doesn't mean that he is without uh, his duty to, to be of service to other people, that he is, you know, one amongst many in this world and that you know the hard times are here to teach us and the good times are here to remind us what we're fighting for and so i think it's really just important to instill in on him how lucky he is and how the only free high in life is doing for others that i found that yeah. and, and heavy heavy squats <laughs> Well, uh, listen, I, I agree with you there. And I, what's interesting, Josh, too, is that you, you think about like uh, the, the trials and the failures and the, and the tribulations that go along with it and, and how much it sucked. But then when you look back on it, you're like, wow, I really wouldn't be who I am today if that never happened. So it's like you're, you're I, I'm kind of blessed in a way by having some of the things that have happened to me that might not have been good. So that makes me think that when things are going bad now. I look at it in a different way saying, well, wait a minute, if the things that happened bad before ended up making me a good, ended up putting me in a good situation, maybe these bad things that are happening now will put me in a better situation later. I don't know the outcome of it. So I look at it a little differently now, if that makes sense. No, you're right on. I totally get that. It's truly the silver lining. And I'm sure it's why you do this podcast and why I wrote this book, right? It's like trying to share with fellow travelers, um, a view from the hat, like for me, it's a view from the halfway point. It's like, I'm not done. I'm not at the mountaintop, but I, I'm not great at relating to people who have summited the mountain. I like to hear from people that are just a few steps ahead of me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. And, and touching back in there, I know you said you say prayers before bed. What, what does the bedtime routine look like for you guys with Max? Now you got it down to a science. Are you a lullaby guy? You're telling them stories. What's bedtime looking like? Oh my gosh. I don't know if I'm saying too much here, but you know, I don't think my wife would mind. So my son needs to be hyped up. Like he's one of the starting five for the Los Angeles Lakers. So he'll go in our living room and we'll go in our bedroom and, or I'll go in his room. And usually it's my wife who does this, but sometimes me. And we'll start saying now coming to bed, he's three foot tall, 36 pounds and and you have to mention his favorite player in the nba too so we'll go max lebron james peck and then we'll start running in his room my wife will be there for like the high five line as he's going through and he sort of jumps in her arms and we'll read a story and sing a song and and put him down yeah, awesome. Yeah, I, I got three boys. Then we got our girl on the fourth try. I used to do that with my boys. I used to call it rough stuff. I rough them up. We do the wrestling with each other, get them all hyped up, tire them out before they had to lay down. It used to make for an easier transition. That's awesome. Yeah, man. It's um, it's just so fun. All those little like, you know, it's easy. I, I love Seinfeld says like, it's not about quality time. All time is great. Garbage time with your kids is great. Like, it's all these little things where you're like, oh, when I teach them how to shoot a basketball or when I see them, you know, graduate kindergarten, those will be the the sweet moments where it's like, no, it's all good. Yeah, it's every day, day in and day out, every moment. And then 
Back into the book here. Tell the listeners here, um, who is this book for? Who is this book for? Who's it addressed to and where can they find it? Where's the best place for them to go? Uh, you can find the book at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, all the places you buy books. And I think, look, it's a book for people who are who are trying and a, a book for people who, who you know, hopefully, if, you know, whether you've watched me grow up or not, I think to me – the best, as I said, the best advice I've ever got is from someone who's a few steps ahead of me and is sort of re relaying back intel from the front lines. And I think that we're all doing our best in this sort of Instagram culture to not judge ourselves against others, compare and despair, but to do a little bit better each day. And so I hope that through some of the challenge that I talk about in the book and my way in which of walking through it, people can feel not only seen, but hopefully feel like they too uh, can face a similar challenge and walk through it with the uh, with the uh, hopefully a certain level of grace. Yeah, re really, really good stuff, Josh. And and, and I'm going to put the link in the description of today's podcast episode so my listeners can tap and get over there and uh, pre-order, order a copy. This should this should be dropped already by the time this is out. And then bringing it, but one more question here too about with, with Max. As far as discipline goes, I know the three year old stage could be challenging. There, are you a timeout guy? You're spanking them. What kind of disciplinary are you as a dad so far here? You know, I grew up, my mom, when I used to mess up as a kid, and granted, this was the 80s, and also, like, she had to be both parents, right? So she wasn't afraid to son me. Like, if I messed up, my mom would sometimes talk to me like I cut her off in traffic. Like, I was getting yeah. cursed out, no no messing around. But And she was a great mom, but, you know, the buck had to stop with her. With my child, it's, you know, I defer to my wife, and she just has this, and it's not like this gentle parenting. It's not like overly you know hands off you know you don't want to hurt your kids feelings it's just more about like relate to them the way you'd want someone to relate to you and model you know for your child the way you want them to be so if you puff up on them and you yell at him like he's going to know that yelling is a way in which things can be conveyed and so don't be surprised if he ever yells back at you one day so I've watched my wife so many times where my son's done something he shouldn't wear. She gets down on his level and says, like, in a very direct, unemotional way, this is why that can't happen. And I try to mimic that. And and I wait for a, a sorry from him. And if he's feeling a bit stubborn, I go, OK, come on, we'll go hang out in your room until you're ready to say sorry. But it's <laughs> not like screaming, yelling. Granted, he's only three, but it's been working well so far. <laughs> I love that, Josh. And then back to your career here. I know you got the book that's dropping now. Uh, you got a lot of stuff in the pipeline here. What, what are you working on? What kind of goals or plans do you have here for the future? What's next for you? Um, I'm working on my podcast on uh, called Male Models. I've got a, a small part in this Netflix movie coming out called 13 The Musical. And yeah, and How I Met Your Father on Hulu right now. All right. Love it. Last thing I'm going to hit you with here. I love to ask all the dads that I get on the podcast, what type of advice do you have for that new dad or for that about to be father who's out there listening? The only advice I give new parents is it's going to be great because I don't know if you've, you've uh, experienced this, but I find people love like they, they have this this kink for scaring new parents. They love to say things like, oh, sleep now or your life's going to change forever. And I mean, that goes without saying. But you know what? Any momentary discomfort you feel from being a bit tired or 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 the disruption of your life will be utterly and completely overshadowed by how wonderful this new human is that honestly is a great distraction from yourself. If you let your kid be a great distraction from you, um, then you'll be in heaven. If you want to forcefully you know, make it all about you and not about them, then you're, you're going to be uh, unhappy a lot of the time. Yeah. Great message, Josh. Yeah. Listen, I, I love what you say there because I'm always trying to encourage the young dads to not to stay away from that warning. Uh, wait till they're teething, wait till they're walking, wait till they, I, I don't like that doom and gloom. We need more fatherhood ambassadors. Tell them the truth. You know what I mean? Uh, about how great the experience is. So I, I love what you have to say about that. Your first class father all the way. And thank you so much for giving me a few minutes of your time here at first class fatherhood. Oh, I love chatting with you, man. Thank you so much.